I'm kind of a subdued Kathy Boone, and here are the announcements for July 23rd. Craft Circle meets tomorrow at 1 p.m. in room 204. If you have a passion for social justice, then be a part of our social justice ministry team and see Chris Spencer for more information. If you are interested in helping with the Student Weekend Food Program, please let Tom Herbelsheimer or Edda Maloney or the office know. School begins on July 31st. Packing bags should start as early as Tuesday, August 15th at 1.30 p.m. And that's only a few weeks away. And now, all the way from West Airport Road, the Reverend Michael J. Eaton. <laughs> Way out there from West Airport Road, yes. I think I've hit probably close to 45 miles an hour going down that hill on my bicycle. And I've broken speed limits too, going down Phoenix Street as well. <laughs> but anyway, good morning, beloved children of God. Good morning. It's good to see all of you, but my goodness, where is everybody? Does anybody know? People are hiding? Vacation? Do right, retired people take vacation? I'm thinking that when retirement comes, it's going to be a lifelong vacation for the rest of my life. Anyway, but it's good to see your faces. Take a moment now. Turn around. People behind you, in front of you, beside you. Tell them how glad you are to see them in worship. All right, I see things have gotten out of control, so I better bring you all back. But it's always good to just greet one another on Sunday morning, right? But there's plenty of time afterward as well with the refreshments to catch up on people's lives and, and all of that, and plus enjoy some goodies too. So friends, as we worship God this morning, let's make sure that we give God our best. Amen? Amen. All right. I invite you to stand now as you are able as we begin our singing.
altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Oh, you came to the earth, you created, all for love's sake. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, join me as we say the opening prayer. God, God of ages past, past and days yet, yet to come, journey, journey with, with us today. Journey, journey with us on our days, days whether on treacherous paths or beside still waters. Guide our steps to find solid ground that we may know the firm foundation of your constant presence. Open our minds to the blessings and miracles we encounter along the way. In your holy name we pray, amen. Today's reading will be from Genesis chapter 28 verses 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord. The God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his holy sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. May the church hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. Amen. Thank you. 
Oh, there we go. So the sermon series continues imagining a new reality with today shine like the sun. Now, how many of you remember the movie Far and Away? Just a couple. It came out in 1992. <laughs> but it has a wonderful illustration about, because it has similarities to the story we just heard about Jacob. Uh, it was written by uh, Amy Gentcroft and Tom Cruise and his wife, Nicole Kidman, at that time, starred in the movie. And the, the plot uh, is about a guy named Joseph Donnelly. He's a young Irishman. He's facing property eviction. Right? that occurs after his father's death. While his father was alive, you know, the dad sometimes can hold things together, but dad was away uh, and died. So uh, Joseph has to take things under his own hands, um, but he decides to take revenge on a man by the name of Daniel Christie, who is the landlord. And instead of killing Christie, however, he is injured and sentenced to a duel with Christie's arrogant manager by the name of Stephen Chase. So while all that is happening, Shannon, who is Daniel's daughter, is growing dissatisfied with the, her boring parents and the boring life she has in Ireland. So she helps Joseph to escape Ireland and go to the United States where they can start life anew. So they end up in Boston where Joseph becomes a boxer and he's winning all his fights and, and Shannon works in the chicken plant and everything is going well until Joseph loses a fight. And with that, and if you remember that scene, it's kind of, he gets booted out, they take all his money away, so he and Shannon are poor, and it happens to be snowing, and it's cold, and all of this, and Shannon gets very sick, and they bust into a house, but Joseph decides when he finds out that her family is here, he takes and carries her to them and deposits them with her so that she can get some healing. So... After this accident, Joseph decides to head on the railroad and go west, right? That's where uh, young men are supposed to go, right? That's the voice I heard to come out in 1978. Go west, young Michael, young man. Um, and he's working on the railroad. But after many years of working on the railroad, his father confronts him in a dream. Basically, what are you doing here? You need to do better than this. You remembered that you wanted to have your own land. You desired your own land. So Joseph decides to join the wagon trains to go out. To, I believe it's Oklahoma, I think, or somewhere out there, uh, just in time for the, the big land race where everybody, they're lining up in their wagons and horses and what are they going to run. And uh, the word is sent, go, and everybody goes. And... Uh, I'll just have to tell how, the, how it ends. But if you remember, he kind of gets gored or something. I can't remember how he gets hurt. But in the movie, when his father dies, it's like you can see his father is like watching the earth disappear below him. The father comes back quickly. But the same thing happens for Joseph because Shannon is there next to him and say, don't you die, basically. But then he, his life is going away, but then he comes back and then he stands up and they plant the flag. That's his land. That's how it goes. If you have not seen the movie, watch it. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. So let's recall the grief that Jacob brought upon himself. All right? Now, Jacob's name literally means heel grabber or supplanter. And remember that when Jacob was being born, first out came Esau, and on his heel was a little hand, and that little hand, I think, was trying to grab Esau, pull it back in the wound so Jacob could come out first. But the scriptures don't say it that way. Basically, he was grabbing the heel. So that's why he was giving the name of Jacob or Yaakov in Hebrew. Um, so later in life as an adult, Jacob supplants his brother two times. Two times. First, Esau comes home from hunting a day, and he is very hungry. And guess who has a pot of stew, and who's probably doing this, blowing in Esau's direction, so that Esau will inhale it and feel how hungry it is. And so Esau says, please give me some of that soup. And Jacob says, well, 
How about you give me your birthright? Jacob or Esau is so hungry, he says, oh, yes, you can have it. Now, this is important. Because when a birthright is given, when the firstborn in the ancient world is, that's the person who is the inheritor of the estate after the father's death. So that means that Esau is no longer going to get land, all right? It's going to be Jacob. The second time, Rebecca overhears her beloved husband, who's probably on his deathbed by now, or close to it, tells his son Esau, go out there and bring back some game and cook it up for me so that I may eat with you and bless you. So Esau goes away. Rebekah concocts a plan to disguise Jacob to be like Esau. Now, Esau probably smelled a lot like being out in the woods all the time, so that means that Jacob had to smell that way, and then he had to put, because Esau had furry arm hairs, and so they had to put fur on so that the father, who Isaac could hardly see, he could smell, oh yeah, you smell like Esau. Let me touch you. Oh yeah, you feel like Esau. And so Jacob gets the blessing. Jacob gets the blessing. So Esau finds out about the treachery. And in Genesis chapter 22, verses 34 through 37, it is written, When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, father. But he, Isaac, said, Your brother came deceitfully. And he has taken away your blessing. Esau, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And look, now he has taken away my blessing. And then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have already made him your Lord. And have given him all his brothers and servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. Esau is mad. In fact, Esau vows to kill Jacob as soon as Isaac dies. So guess what Jacob has to do? He has to get out of town. He has to get out of town. So Rebecca goes to her husband and convinces that it's important to send Jacob out of town so that it's a good thing that Isaac can see his boy go. It's because that Hittite women in the territory wouldn't be good enough to marry Jacob. All right? You may recall that that's how Isaac met Rebekah, that uh, Rachel felt that uh, nobody would be good enough to marry Isaac, who lived in this land. You had to go back to the ancestral land, to Haran. Okay? And so, what better place to go for Jacob? Go back to Haran. Because Rebekah's brother, Laban, is there, and he could find... Uh, Solace there, find a home there, find a wife there. So Isaac agrees to that. I'm sure that Jacob already had his bag packed, was ready to go, and now he's a fugitive. He's a fugitive. In Romeo and Juliet, Act, scene, act 3, Scene 3, Shakespeare writes this, Ha, banishment, be merciful, say death, for exile has more terror in his look much more than death. Do not say banishment. There is no world without Verona walls, but purgatory, torture, hell itself. Hence, banished is banished from the world, and the world's exile is death. Then banished is death mistermed, calling death banished. Thou cutst my head off with a golden axe and smiles upon the stroke that murders me. Wow. Shakespeare had it right. When someone has to leave their land to be banished away, and perhaps that's exactly what Jacob was feeling, what Shakespeare wrote a few thousand years later. Okay, For Jacob was cut off the world that he knew. He didn't know anything about Haran, except maybe what his daddy told him or his grandpa told him. But yet that's where he was going to go. He makes his way to a place called Luz. And Luz was probably an area that was set aside for Canaanite worship. So Jacob, being tired from his travels, finds a little spot uh, to, to lay down and sleep. Now the rabbis say the stone was not used for a pillow. Imagine 
Try this when you get home today. Find a stone and see if you can put your head on it and fall asleep. It's not going to happen. More than likely, it was beside him for whatever reason, along with some other stones. But these stones would be later used. These stones would be later used. Jacob will now have his first encounter with God. His first encounter with God. So there is a dream that's commonly referred to as Jacob's ladder, right? However, ladder is not a very good translation. In fact, I'm not sure any ladders have been found in any kind of archaeological digs in Mesopotamia. More than likely, stairways were found. And more than likely, the better translation is Jacob dreamed of a ramp that went up to heaven. Now, Jacob would understand this kind of uh, image because in Mesopotamia, there were places called ziggurats. You may have heard of that, but they are uh, basically temple areas that have ramps built up to go to certain levels, up as high as seven le uh, levels. So it would start with one or two ramps going up to one level, then another ramp going up, and, and you can see where this is going. It's going up to heaven. <laughs> In fact, the Tower of Babel story is probably, that's what they were building, a ziggurat that would reach as high as heaven. Probably a common, if you've seen the, the pyramids and uh, the Mayan and the Aztec periods, they have steps or ramps that go up to their temples. That's kind of what a ziggurat is, a very large place. And at the very top, that's where the priests would, so to speak, speak with their deities. That's where they would make their sacrifices and all of that. So this is what Jacob is probably seeing. Now, God is beside him. So the translation could either, or we could either think that, that Jacob is either up there with God in heaven or God is down there with Jacob. It could go either way. But I kind of favor the one up above because when God says, look, this is going to be all your land someday, Jacob can see all around. There's angels going up and down that Jacob sees. The rabbis say that angels come down from heaven to do their work for God. They're, they bring messages. That's what angels do. They bring messages. And then when they're done with their work, they go back up. So it's a constant, a lot of work going on that uh, God has to oversee with angels going, coming to earth and all of that. So this is all what's happening in this dream. So God has this conversation with Jacob. And God basically wants to affirm the covenant that was made with Abraham, his grandpa, and with Isaac, his father. Okay? And the thing is that this fugitive now is assured by God that he will dwell in this land. Jacob will have a lot of descendants. So this is following through. See, when God makes a promise, God continues to see that promise will be fulfilled in whatever way possible. Now, you may recall that both Abraham and Isaac experienced this when they both had to go down into Egypt for a while, and both Abraham and were Isaac, because they married such beautiful women, they were thought that they would be taken away and they would be killed. So Abraham and Isaac pass off Sarah and Rebecca. Oh, she's my sister. She's my sister. That way they won't get killed. So what does a God do when Abraham and Isaac are, you know, God probably, goes, oh my. So God has to go into a dream to Pharaoh and say, do not do anything with these women. They are really married. And so then, of course, both Abraham and Isaac get a talking to by the Pharaoh and another fella, because Abraham does it twice, I believe. But the idea is there that the covenant was almost in danger. It was in jeopardy. So God has to interfere in a dream. Just like with Jacob, the covenant is in jeopardy. Jacob's a fugitive. He's going to go away from the promised land. So God has to assure Jacob that it'll be okay. Even though you are a rascal, I will still be with you. All right? Now, how many of us have been rascals in the past? Yeah. God still loves rascals. All right? Still loves rascals. 
So the bishop, Stephen Charleston, I think he's an Episcopalian, writes, he wrote this on Facebook. He says, I am the mystic of the dollar store and the all-night diner. I am the prophet waiting in the drive through to get my coffee. What is most sacred is usually right in front of us, right where we live. The holy is in the everyday, the common, the simple. It is hidden in places that have become so routine for us that we hardly notice them anymore. There are revelations in the hallway and epiphanies on the playground. All around us, the presence of the Spirit is here, vibrant and alive, just waiting for us to make a connection. Our spiritual discoveries may sometimes be on mountaintops, but nine times out of ten, they're made while looking at old photos or hearing a piece of music that suddenly makes you a time traveler. I am the pilgrim of the neighborhood, the sage of the shared wisdom, stopping by to wish you well, bringing you a word you have known all your life. This is basically God talking to Jacob about all that. So in a spot somewhere in the desert that seemed like an ordinary place for Jacob to rest, Jacob experiences this holy moment. He recognizes this when he wakes up. He says, God was in this place, and I, I did not know it. So Jacob wants to mark this spot, which for him is a thin place between heaven and earth. Have you ever heard of that? There's thin places between heaven and earth. I believe they're all around in different places, especially in Iona, Scotland, in a church that's been there since 700s. A place where it's so thin that you could touch and press and heaven touches back. Sometimes we don't realize that in our daily living, how close heaven is to us, how close the holy is to us. So Jacob experiences this, and he wants to mark this spot. So he takes those stones that were around him, he pours oil over them, gathers them up, and, and makes a bit of a pillar. And the place will no longer be remembered as a spot for Canaanite worship, Canaanite, but rather he calls it Bethel, which literally means house of God, house of God. Rufus Jones, a Quaker writer, he tells a story that took place over a century ago in the heyday of the Sunday school movement. He says, a Boston, mad ha a Boston man had the noble impulse of starting Sunday school on an isolated island off the coast of Spain, uh, Maine. And the fisher folk that, on that tiny island had little contact with the outside world. There was no church on the island so the teacher gathered up all the children and, and brought them down to the beach and, and uh, gave them the very first lesson. And this is his first question. Can you tell me where the Atlantic Ocean is? The children had no idea. They had no idea. There was a pause. There was silence. They weren't being shy, nor they were being tactern in a down east fashion. Each little face stared back, uncomprehending. None of the children knew where the Atlantic Ocean was. They knew where the sea was. Far better than the educated Bostonian who was speaking to them because they could smell the air, they could see the pounding surf, the treacherous curtains that which their fathers ventured out every day. The ocean, the Atlantic, was a different matter. The ocean belonged to the world of geographers and map makers, and that world was far removed from the world they knew, the world that was present to them. They knew their holy spot was the, the water lapping up on the beach. So Bethel is a part of the landscape. There's probably a, a little bit of desert there, a little bit of different plants, a little bit trees. And Bethel would look like any other place in the vicinity. But Bethel is the holy spot where Job, Jacob encountered God. Richard Rohr writes, everything belongs to the gift of contemplative prayer. He writes this, we cannot attain the presence of God because we're already in the presence of God. 
What's absent is awareness. Little do we realize that God's love is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means that God is choosing us now and now and now. We have nothing to attain or even learn. We do have, however, have to unlearn some things. To become aware of God's loving presence in our lives, we have to accept that human culture is a mass hypnotic trance. We're sleepwalkers. All great religious teachers have recognized that we human beings do not naturally see. We have to be taught how to see. Jesus says further, if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. From Luke chapter 11, verse 14, 34. Religion is meant to teach us how to see and be present to the reality that surrounds us. That's why the Buddha and Jesus say with one voice, be awake, be awake. Jesus talks about staying watchful in the parables in the latter part of Matthew. And the word Buddha means, I am awake in Sanskrit. So Rohr continues, he said, prayer is not necessarily saying words or thinking thoughts. It is rather a stance. It is a way of living in the presence, living in the awareness of the presence, and even enjoying the presence. That is the presence of God. The contemplative, contemplative is not just aware of God's loving presence, but trusts, allows, and delights in that presence. It's like being a kid in a toy box, okay? That we are surrounded by all these joyful things that, that bring us such pleasure. We are in the presence of God constantly. So how have you experienced God in your life? Think about it right now. What has that been like? How will you experience God this week, now that I've told you to open your eyes? Or I should say Richard has. We are sometimes like Jacob. We're, we're on the run. In our daily routines, we're on the run trying to avoid pain. We're on the run trying to get ahead in life. And no matter where we go or whatever we do, we can be assured that God is with us, even if we're a rascal. I'll say that again. God is constantly with us. Perhaps we don't pay attention to our dreams at night to understand how God might be trying to reach us like Jacob. But God certainly wants us to know that we are deeply loved by God. Deeply loved. So loved that God gave his son to be with us, to help us, and to die, and come back again, and show us life is always good by following Jesus. Granted, there can be heartache on the way, but ultimately, we are in God's presence. So God wants us to live well in God's kingdom, and to enjoy the best that life has to offer. So I invite you this week, try to reach out and find those thin places, those thin places between heaven and earth, and be cognizant, be aware, have your eyes and ears open, your senses aware of how you might be treading through a holy spot, which might seem mundane first looking, but there awaits a wonderful God experience. Friends, shine like the sun this week. Shine, shine, shine. Because we have a wonderful God, a loving God, that just loves us immensely. So in the morning, when you wake up and you're shining in front of that mirror, I'll remind you once again, behold that creature, that creation that is staring back at you is a blessed child of God. Smile at that reflection. Smile at that reflection and give thanks to God that you are here in this world enjoying the best that God has to bring for us. Amen. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly
heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Walking in sunshine all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake you, promise divine that never can fail. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light in him is no darkness, ever I'm walking close to his side. In the bright sunshine, never rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunshine, sunshine of love. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. So how many remember that from Sunday school or vacation Bible school? Some people do. That's why Brenda picked it. <laughs> it's a lovely song. Oh, Friends, now it's time for prayer. And as always, during the prayer time, I will leave time for you to say out loud the names of loved ones or situations that, that need prayer for whatever reason. So let's now sing ourselves into prayer. Beloved, we say good morning to you. And what a morning it is. An opportunity for us to come together, to visit with one another, to worship with one another, to sing praises to you, to hear your word read and proclaimed, but ultimately, God, to experience you in some way, whether it is through the visitations, whether it is through the singing, whether it is through the prayers or the word, or the preaching, somehow you are trying to reach us. Help us to always be open to such times, not just here on Sunday morning, but through the week of whatever we do, wherever we go, whoever we meet, there are opportunities to experience you in special and holy ways. As we come together as a family of faith, brothers and sisters in Christ, siblings. Some of us come with concerns about loved ones and things that are happening in our world. So we take a few moments, beloved, that you might hear what's on our hearts. Oh, beloved, sometimes we don't know how to pray or what to say, but you know. You know the needs of all those people that were raised to you. And so please, Bring the right blessings that are needed for each and every one named. We do offer our prayers for families who are in a time of grief, that your healing presence would be made known to them and help them to experience you and give them assurance that beloved, their beloved, are resting with you and all the saints on high. We pray for those who are in need of healing, for whatever disease or illness they face, 
for those who are lying in hospital beds who might be all alone, that you would be present to them and be involved in their healing. We look to our world and know that there are forest fires that are raking havoc upon the planet's surface. There's rainfall that brings floods. People's lives are being affected by the great heat that is happening. So please, oh God, help your planet to be healed and help us to do our best in doing things that are planet healing. Help us to be reminded as we leave this place of worship that we are constantly attended to by you and that we can joyfully live out each day because it is a beautiful day that you bless us with. So thank you for listening as we offer this prayer to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. just love those words the spirit scheming our deepest dreaming wonderful people some people are gift with poetry really well I wish I had that gift oh friends now is the time to talk about our offering now first I want to thank you for your continued generosity you've had an opportunity before the service to put it in the basket there's always opportunity after the service. To celebrate the offering we take today, let us now offer this prayer. Holy God, we are living in days of division and polarization, and we regretfully confess that your church is not exempt from that statement. Regardless of where we stand, it is too, too easy to look at those who see things differently and see them as weeds stunting the good fruit we should bear. As we bring our offerings to you, the temptation to focus on our own agenda is strong. Help us to give generously without judging. Give us the faith to put them to your use and humility to know that only you can see clearly what is sweet and what is weed. We pray in the name of Christ, who knows all hearts. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. God laughs a lot when uh, we worship and just smiles and laughs and say, oh, what fun my people are having when they goof up. And even when we don't goof up. <laughs> Friends, all are invited to this table. You don't have to be a United Methodist or a member of this church. 
but it is Christ our Lord who invites to his table all who desire to repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So we come before God seeking his forgiveness for our sins. We confess that we have not loved our neighbor as we loved ourselves. We have failed to be an obedient people. We confess that God is not always first in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, as we strayed from your path of righteousness. Through his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, Christ Jesus offers redemption to those who earnestly seek to live in God's grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thank you. Christ invites to his table set in celebration of God's gift to his people. In this simple meal, we find forgiveness and are challenged to go into the world to proclaim the good news. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he gave thanks to you. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples, his friends, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and then gave it to his disciples, his friends, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Through the bread we are made the body of Christ. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ so we may go out into the world to glorify God's name. And now, oh, beloved God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world so that we may do as he, we have prayed. <laughs> Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Amen. Amen. Since we are God's children, we are now bold to pray what Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now take a moment to look around at each other, siblings in Christ, all right? Wonderful creations. We have been brought together by the love of our Lord, and that is symbolized in the breaking of this bread, for we, when we break the bread, we are sharing in the body of Christ. <clears throat> And the cup over which we give thanks, it is a sharing in the sacrifice, in the love, and in the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are God's gifts for you, God's children, and we do have gluten-free as well.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant now we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able as we close our service. Remember, through those doors is a wonderful world, a mission field, a place filled with holy places. Remember that each step, each breath that you take is because God is with you. And you need to share that good news with everybody you meet this week. So while you're doing that, make sure you laugh a lot. Make sure you have as much fun as you can this side of the galaxy because they're catching up on the other side. <laughs> that you enjoy life. Live in Christ. Be at peace. Now go in peace. Amen. Hey.